Hey everybody, I want to talk a little bit today about control surfaces. This is something I've been interested in for a long time. I've used various control surfaces over the past 20 years, and uh, I am always looking for the next thing that's going to be better. But I always have to remind myself that maybe what it is I'm looking for either doesn't exist or isn't going to be as beneficial as perhaps I think it will be. So I thought I would make this video. This is what I would call an introduction to or a primer about the technology we have available in 2024. So let's start by talking about protocols. These are the ways that the control services talk to our software. We have this one called Huey or the human user interface. This is really something from the vein of Pro Tools, DigiDesign, built on a Mackie protocol, which is actually uh, the next one. Those are very similar. They allow for a number of things to be standardized in terms of if you have a control surface with faders and it's designed with the Mackie control or the Huey protocol in mind, and the software is designed to receive that data, then you move a fader and it moves a fader inside the software. You don't have to do a ton of setup, uh, but you're limited to what was designed on the hardware and what the software is capable of. Um, they're not exactly equal. I would say the Mackie control tends to have a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more powerful, but Huey is very reliable. And uh, if you're using Pro Tools, for instance, and some of these, you may be locked into that. We have Yukon, which is a protocol uh, that came from Euphonics that is now owned um, by Avid Pro Tools. Uh, but it works with some other software like Logic Pro, for instance, as an example, can use the Yukon. It's a different type of protocol. Instead of being built off of the MIDI technology, this one uses a network technology. It's faster, it can do more, and um, Certainly, it's a really great tool in many cases. We have MIDI control data. This is you know the old school way of doing things, except we still have many interfaces which use this. Not with Huey or Mackie control, but just simply the, the continuous control data. We have OSC, which we had a lot of hope for doing more, and it's still there, but certainly is not, has not taken over um, in many ways, especially with hardware, it's mostly a software thing. Um, and then we have the MPE, the MIDI polyphonic expression, which uh, is alive and well with certain manufacturers, but it uh, hasn't been widespread adapted, adopted, and, um, and it has some, some other quirks to it. We're expecting more to come with MIDI 2.0, in terms of some of uh, the overall functionality, but each one of these has its strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and let's talk a little bit about those because there's one piece of data that I'm most interested in talking about today uh, that I hear people use in their promotional material all the time, um, which is the, the bit depth of the resolution of things like the faders and the knobs. A typical controller will have things like Faders, knobs, and buttons. Assignable, often, uh, not always, but uh, most of the time I think we have seen these be assignable, um, meaning that they may follow the Mackie control and be automatically assigned, but that you could also adopt other connections that do different things. Motorized components. Faders might be motorized. They might not be. That means if uh, you're working with uh, a fader to control a fader in your mixer and the software, and then you let go and uh, it plays back the automation you created that the fader will move in accordance with that. So it actually has a mechanism for that to move. Many of the knobs actually wouldn't benefit from a motorization because you want them to be able to just continuously turn and turn and turn depending on the data they're doing. But um, the faders are something that we definitely see some benefits and considered an upgrade with some of these uh, controllers. Some of them have screens, 
little LED screens that give you information, uh, buttons that you can push that change depending on what they're being used for, um, all the way up to an iPad screen, which is just a screen, and all of the information is on that. So that is definitely a feature we might see. A transport section, so you can do play, zoom, scroll, uh, that's pretty typical in many of these things. And then some sort of software bundle um, utility that will help you maintain things like the firmware of the device, might let you do customized um, setups that change what each of the buttons do and all of that thing that go along with that. The data resolution, I talked about this briefly a minute ago, but what's the deal with the data resolution? Does it even matter? So we have a number of different things, and I've got an example for each one here. The Touche, uh, which is a great device. It has four axes on this where you can move things around, and it outputs MIDI data or even control voltage. It's a, a really handy thing, but when you use it as a MIDI controller, it uses control data, which is a 7-bit format, 128 steps of resolution. So Great for some things, especially MIDI instruments, which only really have, in some cases, 128 steps, but not great for other things. Um, so this would be, like, in terms of all my controllers, the, the bottom bar in terms of the resolution. Uh, the M Plus from Icon, it's my 8-channel, and it has a master fader on as well, motorized and everything. It's 10-bit, uh, which means that it has more resolution than the seven bit by actually quite a few um, amounts. We'll talk more about how to tell exactly what that means in a minute. The V1X also from Icon, their new line has 12 bit for their faders. The CS12, uh, which is one of the devices I do wanna talk a little bit more about today, um, has up to 14 bit. Uh, and they say up to because it's not the default. There's like a fine mode where you can put it in there and you'll have a deeper resolution. And uh, Yukon, which uses a version of this, it's 32-bit or 32-bit float. Um, not everything is going to be 32-bit. That just means that's the entire through port and it can do a lot simultaneously. And so each individual piece uh, is going to be at a higher resolution, but... It, uh, it doesn't mean that it's going to be like that for an, on a fader. The faders are not going to be, for example, 32-bit as opposed to some of these others. So here's the, the little formula we would use. You put 2 to the power of whatever the bit is, and that's how many distinct uh, steps are in something for this. So the 7-bit, if we do this, is going to be 128. Um, the 10-bit if we do that, is going to be 1,024. I mean, that's quite a few steps more than 128. Uh, that 12-bit with the V1X is going to be 4,096. And last in this one, the, the CS12 is going to be 16,384. Uh, and so quite a big difference there with these. How much does it really matter? So I have the the M plus and um, it has decent sized faders on it. And at 10 bit, I hardly ever have any uh, issues with that. Um, there may be a few times when I'm moving quickly on it and you know it's skipping some numbers in the automation. But that's not necessarily the resolution. That's maybe the quality of the fader. And so the real distinction here is less about the data. I do recommend avoiding anything that's that has faders or knobs, which are all just 7-bit, uh, just the basic MIDI functionality. I recommend at least 10 uh, or above. But it's really the build quality and the design of the faders. And so if you get somebody who says, you know, this is 10-bit, and um, they sell you something that's not very well designed, it's not going to really help you as much because there's going to be some inconsistencies as you move the fader, or maybe the fader's a really short throw, and so it's not going to be moving along that much. If the data resolution doesn't really matter, 
then what does matter? And let me talk to you through my particular setup of choices that I've made with my equipment. I have an 88 key keyboard right in front of me. It's nice hammer action. Uh, I go more for the feel than necessarily anything else with the keyboard. I want to be able to play it and enjoy playing it. It's a Studio Logic 88 key, which was budgetarily the right price as well. There are more expensive ones that are even nicer, but that was a good option. Um, I have an HB1, which is a breath controller, and it as well does uh, CC MIDI data. And so it's not 10, 12, 14 bit. It's just a really nice high quality breath controller that maximizes what it does do. And it's wonderful. It's amazing, but it's very expensive for what it is. It's like seven or $800. Um, and then the Touche, which I also use with uh, MIDI control data. And so both of those are used for performances with MIDI instruments, not necessarily for mixing. Um, I use my iPad Pro all the time with Logic Remote. I think the integration is really nice. It's um, it's using a type of integration that goes right into Logic and, uh, and connects all that stuff. It's a, a network type connection. It's uh, relatively low latency and gives you a ton of options. I have that with the docking stand. And then I use the Icon M Plus for the faders. Um, and they are decent quality. I've enjoyed them. They're, you know, it's, they have all the components for mixing that I need, the motors, the touch sensitivity, the ability to solo mute and record arm and to do automation, it has a transport. All of that is fine and good. If I were to add one piece of gear, it would probably be the CS12, just because it does something that very few other controllers do. It actually is built in this first instance of it, this first release as a Logic Pro controller and not a Mackie control or a Huey or a Yukon or a MIDI controller. It um, is using the API from Apple and really tightly integrating inside the software. It only has one fader, which is one of the reasons why I don't have it yet. Um, there, I had a choice recently to, to get a few different pieces of gear and I wanted more with the eight faders rather than just the one with other knobs because I have the Logic Pro remote app, which does so much of what the CS12 does. However, something about the flat screen with the, uh, with the iPad is a little bit of an issue. You don't have any tactile. You can't really reach for it without looking. You have to look and, and use your eyes every time you're doing it because you have to maintain that, uh, that positional with your fingers. Uh, with the M plus eight fader uh, you know, control surface, I can almost reach over and just touch. And I'm like, oh, that's number two. I can get right to number two without having to uh, look down even. And so I, I really like parts of that tactile experience that the iPad doesn't exactly get. So with the CS12, you have the tactile, you have the deep integration, you have the knobs, which you can use to, to do your effects and things. And so I think there's a huge benefit for that. So that's what I would be adding. Um, each one of the things I currently have fulfill a different role. None of them are really a replacement for the, for the other. My breath controller and the Touche, I'm not gonna use those for mixing and controlling plugins. They're a performance tool. Uh, the M Plus I'm gonna use instead of the little uh, fader, the graphic faders on the iPad because there's something about that tactile experience which is so important to me personally. Um, I'm not going to play the MIDI piano on the iPad. I'm going to use my the big keyboard. So each one you have to decide, does it really help or does it not really help? None of these things are easily portable. So I have to have a station where I'm going to be setting this up and working on it. That may be a huge factor for some of you. Um, I have a couple other little keyboards like uh, the Mini from Mackay, and it has little faders on it, which you can use, but those are very limited in their functionality and could never replace uh, like the M plus control service from Icon. And so you're making these choices. What's the right choice for you? 
That's the thing that you have to ask. Do you want a Mackie control thing that could work with various pieces of software? Do you want the CS12, which is really deep in logic, but doesn't really work right now very well with other pieces of software? Do you want the Yukon, which typically is attached to Avid hardware and is very nice, but very expensive? These are all the questions. So you need to look and see exactly where your budget is, what your needs are, which protocol you want, and then you can make that decision for which of these control surfaces may or may not meet the needs of what you're looking for. Let me take just two minutes at the very end and show you the setup function inside Logic and how to attach this. So um, the Touche and my breath controller and my big keyboard all just come through the MIDI ports. So if I look at a channel on any of these instruments, you will see actually, um, let me go MIDI port. You'll see them show up here if they're there. There's my platform M plus is here, but it's not what I'm using. The HB one is my breath controller and um, we could use that in there. Now to set it up as a control surface though, we come in here to set up and you'll see that I have my phone and my iPad, neither one are connected right now as a control surface, but we could. And then I've got my Mackie control, which is the M plus. So I went into install and I chose, I mean, here's the list of the ones that it knows about, but I chose the Mackie right here, Mackie designs, Mackie control, logic control. Um, we could also, if we were using just Huey, do that one, but this one, the, the actual M plus is Mackie control. Um, but you can see all the other choices. Once I did that, I just added it and then it worked. The software that comes with it is actually relatively, I mean, this is an older device now. It's a few years old. I mean, this is pretty archaic in some ways, but it's literally, you can choose one of these, change what it's gonna do with the message type channel and message, and then send the data to the controller and it will update and use that. And you can save um, a bunch of presets with it, but these are all the buttons and things that this uh, M plus can do. Not a bad list, but it's still relatively uh, focused on just being eight faders plus one master fader eight knobs for things like panning, and then a transport. That's really all that we have with this. Okay, I hope this was useful and you found some good information in here. There's a lot to these protocols, but um, it's worth knowing what you're getting and knowing that perhaps the 10-bit faders on the M Plus are gonna be just perfect for most needs and uh, you don't necessarily need to invest tons and tons of money in something that's just giving you a little bit more. Anyway, food for thought.